photographed all of that. And the other half went to West Point, which is slowly giving it back uh, to the Smithsonian. Uh, so these tuning forks range from, uh, I think, uh, 256 hertz, and that's a big one, which I suspect you can't hear. Oh, yeah. Well, you can hear how loud And the smallest one is this one, and this is exactly 10 times higher. You must be very careful with any tuning forks because this one says 2528. I'm sorry, this is 128, that's 128. Uh, 2560 uh, VS and the French did things by halves. This, these are half vibrations. Uh, also notice that this thing is open on both ends. And this big fellow is solid on the ends. Well, this resonator uh, is a quarter wave resonator. If you actually measure it, the, there's a node at that end, and the anti node is probably out there. You have to make an end correction. But this little fellow is a half wave resonator. And I thought about this uh, certainly recently, and I realized the problem if you made this a half wave resonator, it would only be that long. And then when you banged it, it would go over its nose. So, um, um, let's, let's look at this. This is another invention of Kearney. So neither of these pieces of um, uh, apparatus uh, were made by Kearney. I'd love to get my hands on the original Kearney. But uh, they uh, strip searched me at the University of uh, uh, Mississippi. Most people strip search me after I uh, visit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this is called a manometric flame, and this is a way to make sound visible. Now what you have here is a little capsule, a manometric capsule that's divided in half by a, uh, a membrane, and it's a flexible membrane. So you sing into this, uh, and it would be convenient to put this on, because that's a way of matching the impedance. We don't speak about acoustic impedance anymore, but it's very, that's why there are bells on the end of tubas. Um, they can get the sound out. Think what it would be like if you had a, a flute with a bell on the end. It's very loud. Uh, so you sing it here, uh, let's say a thousand hertz. <coughs> well, I can't do it. <coughs> Duncan, you had perfect pitch, didn't you? I thought you did. Oh. Did you like choral singing? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that causes the membrane to vibrate a thousand times per second. Over here on this side, you have, if I may say so, illuminating gas coming in, which may actually be full of carbon monoxide, so you have to be careful of this stuff. And that burns a little flame about that high. Uh, as this membrane vibrates, uh, the supply of gas is modulated at a thousand hertz. And so this wiggles up a thousand times per second. And indeed, you can see it if you go like this. The second time you do that, you're going to split his head. So what you need to do is to take the time, bit, the linear time base that your head provides, and use something else. And that is what the mirror is for. This is made uh, in Germany. This particular one, uh, in about 1900s, it's back to coal. Uh, you turn the crank and you look at the reflection here. Now, you of course all know about our friend Wheatstone. I have to be a Wheatstone fan here. Myself, uh, you all know that Wheatstone did not invent the Wheatstone Bridge. A man by the second letter Christie did. And Wheatstone borrowed it. And, and, and was very careful to explain where it came from. No plagiarism here. Wheatstone, about 1833 or 34, measured the speed of an electrical signal. And what he had was a long circuit wire signal that went out and came back. Uh, this part went to ground. Uh, there were um, spark gaps here. And he uh, applied a uh, continuous uh, spark, or a series of sparks, to 
this end. Uh, so there's a spark here, and a little bit later there's a spark here. Then he took the rotating mirror and he looked at those sparks, and instead of them being like this, they were spread out. And if he knew how fast this was rotating, uh, he could get the speed of the electrical signal, which came out to be about a half the speed of light. And of course, if you do the calculation, uh, thinking of this as a transmission line, you can actually calculate it. Um, there's another set of self timing device here. How do you know how fast it was spinning? Oh, 30 times. Yeah, here, let me show you this. This is a siren. This was made in Switzerland at the uh, Society Genovese. And if any of you have a Society Genovese catalog, I'd love to get my hands on it. Uh, down here, uh, air comes in, and there are a bunch of holes in this plate right here. And there are corresponding holes in this plate, and this plate can spin. The holes are drilled this way and then that way. And so, when you blow it here, <laughs> you get a musical note. And if you were to examine it, let's say with this, you would see that you get a very nice sine wave. Uh, then there's some, and uh, Barbara, could you grab that big one? The big one? Uh, there, right in front of your hand. Yeah, just pull it up. And show people the back. And you can see that there are some gear wheels there, and it's geared onto the shaft. And there are two other uh, uh, markers here. This, this is a revolution. This is a hundredth of resolution of revolution. This one, regretfully, is uh, missing its hand. Um, and so if you have a stopwatch, and you know how many holes you have here, you can get the absolute frequency of sound based on having a decent stopwatch. Yeah, I don't know. Let's sit back in there. Um, you'll have to come around here to see this. Um, this is an electric meter. Not blue. Sorry about that. Here we go. Uh, if I drop this, I'm down a thousand bucks. So come on around here so you can see this thing. Um, when Thomas Edison uh, started up his Pearl Street power station uh, in Lower Manhattan, about I think the date was 1886 or something like that, plus about a couple of years. Um, he had a lot of technology to worry about. Um, he didn't know how to measure currents uh, without paying money. Now, the normal meter book that we all know uh, it was called the Darcy Ball movement. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very beautiful and very delicate. Um, and usually ticks over on about 50 micro amperes, and so there are shots to be used to take the currents and run it around the meter book. Uh, uh, but he didn't want to pay uh, pay for the uh, uh, use of the patent, and so he had uh, he bought up a Canadian patent. And what this person does is run all the current, which is as much as 176 amperes, Ouch. through that coil. <laughs> now you can see that there is a little iron slug that is draw in there. And this is clearly nonlinear, and it can't be calibrated on first principles. But this is the sort of thing that you find uh, in original power stations. By the way, uh, the consumers uh, simply had uh, a little uh, electroplating uh, cell. And every every month, the meter reader came around and weighed the electrodes to see how much copper had been electroplating. So you weigh your, your coulombs. Uh, this thing, by the way, says General Electric Company, uh, Ampere Meter, Edison System, which tells you that it's DC, uh, and then the patent date there is 1886. 
And by the way, it's very easy to get patents. You just type in Google patents. You get any patent you want. Free. This came from West Virginia University. But I gave my pictures. Okay. Uh, recently, the map of physics has been going around in all sorts of websites. Well, I'm a system, well, I'd be happy if you think so. Um, uh, this was published by uh, Senko in 38, I think. There's a list of Nobel Prizes there. And the last one is uh, Fermi, who, as you remember, had a Jewish wife. Uh, and the uh, uh, Mussolini was my uh, pussy was uh, the Germans at this point, and so uh, Fermi uh, went to Stockholm, accepted the Nobel Prize, came to the U.S., and uh, moved to Fort New Jersey, and started to learn how to be an American. He had terrible troubles with crabgrass in his mouth. <laughs> Read Laura Fermi's book, How to Go Back, and there. But this is grouped up with a lot of people. It's now on at least three websites. Um, now, you all know the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and that, of course, the name that is Hubble. And the person behind that is Lyman Spitzer. And Lyman Spitzer uh, was a professor of astrophysics uh, at Princeton. Uh, and it's actually the person behind the Hubble. I didn't know you had a Hubble and telescope, which until last spring uh, was watched over day by day by James Keith Kalanowski, class of 1969. Uh, great, they thought. His wife, Nancy, uh, works in the FAA. She's a, a, a little plump woman. She's a white lady. But she is in charge of U.S. airspace. Mm. Nancy. Owns that stuff up there. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, the Lyman Spitzer family uh, uh, had, uh, uh, were at a summer house on Martha's Day. Now, some of you may remember Bayes Norton. You will remember Bayes Norton. You will not. Uh, well, he, uh, he was a physical chemist who ran uh, forth in the high room in the in the Olympics in 1928, and he was hired in 1937. One of the first hires by uh, our president, Chalmers. He was hired by Chalmers to teach a course for non-scientists, which he finally did in 1963, when he picked up a fragment and they taught an 18 course of five, which eventually led to me, and I taught it for more. 35 years uh, of natural philosophy. At any rate, uh, and Bayes, by the way, uh, came into the in an 85 PCAP class that dropped dead before the class, which means that you should never have an 85 class. There. Bayes North was a, a native of parts of Mexico. Uh, and so it's clear that about nine, well, between 1940 and 1950, this telescope was given to Kenya for the use of Kenny students. And it was the Spencer uh, family telescope. Uh, we, of course, get you know, better now. We now have a one meter telescope, a uh, reflector. I don't need a one meter, I mean a half meter. You're not sure if one meter be in a big time. Uh, and unfortunately, over the years, it has frozen so it doesn't move around. And I have to get a metal detector for it to help me loosen this thing up. But what I can't do is practically just drag this out and put it in the middle path, make the trees on the side of the And uh, it shows you what was up there. We didn't have a strong force. He just took it out and showed me something. In a very typical Miller way, to snag people going by. <laughs> well, uh, I can talk for hours here. Oh, yes, it's uh, uh, Pam and uh, Lord. 
Lucky and half of New York City and clear a big optical thing in a New York County about 1860 uh, in uh, lower Manhattan. And they had some fairly good people working for them. Uh, this is not a professional grade instrument. This was designed for an advanced average. And we do have all the IP. Oh, you're right. Some of them are there.